Thank you, that was beautiful. Welcome everyone to the First Unitarian Universalist Church, a church of open minds and loving hearts since 1866. Celebrating many sources of wisdom and many spiritual paths, your faith, your doubts, your questions, your identity are welcome here. Join us after service for refreshments in the commons or bring refreshments to the courtyard if it stopped raining. There is a preschool playroom open for young ones and activities for children following the time for all ages. You can find upcoming events in your order of service, including architect meetings throughout the summer as we continue our process for a new church home. Wednesday evenings this summer, join with others for a casual picnic supper at 5.30 at Three Links Park near, near Silver Lake Pool and Playground. All are welcome to attend. Today, we're glad to welcome our guest preacher, the Reverend Terry Berner. She is a Unitarian Universalist minister and senior organizer with Minnesota Interfaith Power and Light. She works with UU congregations and other communities as we act for climate justice and racial justice grounded by our faith and values. And as a person after my own heart, um, she has converted most of her St. Paul yard into native perennial and vegetable garden beds. She also enjoys riding an electric bike and walking the neighborhood with her spouse and dog. We're so glad you're here. Most Sundays, our entire, our entire offering collection goes out the doors of our church to support the work of a more just and loving world. Today, our offering will support the important work of Minnesota Interfaith Power and Light. You can give online or as the, pass, the plates pass today. Thank you for your generosity. Now let us enter this time of worship with the words from your minister, from our minister in the 1870s, Reverend Eliza Tupper Wilkes. May our faith in humanity and our message of hope and good cheer light our way. It's good to be together. You guys can, you all can rise and welcome each other as we start the day. Thank you. 
Our chalice lighting for today comes out of our hymnal, number 451. Flame of fire, spark of the universe that warmed our ancestral hearth, agent of life and death, symbol of truth and freedom. We strive to understand ourselves and our earthly home.
So with the summer theme of delight, I feel a lot of just positive energy coming from that word. But there can be delight in mundane and boring things as well. I mean, my pen last week, remember. So today's story kind of takes that and turns the mundane into the wonderful. And if anybody's read The Invention of Wings by Sumant Kidd, this is in that same um, theme. So today's story is The Year We Learned to Fly by Jacqueline Woodson, illustrated by Rafael Lopez. And unlike this spring, that was the spring when the rain seemed like it would never stop. And the thunder boomed so hard, we weren't allowed to go outside. Use those beautiful and brilliant minds of yours, my grandmother said. Lift your arms and close your eyes, take a deep breath, and believe in a thing. Somebody somewhere at some point was just as bored as you are now. So my brother and I closed our eyes, and for a few minutes that first day, we weren't stuck in our apartment anymore. We were flying over the city we had known our whole lives, but suddenly it was different, exploding with every kind of flower we'd ever dreamed of growing. That was the summer we learned to fly. When my brother and I couldn't stop fussing with each other over whose turn it was to wash the windows or feed the dog or clean the kitchen, we fought and frowned and made silent promises to never speak to each other again. And my grandmother said, lift your arms and close your eyes and take a deep breath and stop being so mean about everything. Somebody somewhere at some point was just as mad as you are now. So we did. And the soft wind took us all over the city and past windows of kids who hadn't yet learned to fly. For my brother and I reached for each other's hands, flying and diving and laughing and leaving all of our mad behind. That was the autumn, our rooms felt too big and lonely, with only us in them and darkness coming so fast. But while we hugged ourselves against the too quiet of it all, we remembered, we don't have to be stuck anywhere anymore. My grandmother had learned to fly from the people who came before. They were aunts and uncles and cousins who were brought here on huge ships, their wrists and ankles cuffed in iron. But my grandmother said, nobody can ever cuff your brilliant and beautiful mind. So our people, she said, they learned to fly. They dreamed a thing and made it happen, closed their eyes and flew away home. Lift your arms, my grandmother said. Close your eyes and remember somebody somewhere at some point had to figure out they could fly. That was the winter we moved away from the building and the block and the friends we had always known. To a street where kids looked at us funny and didn't even answer when we asked them if they wanted to play. It's okay, I said to my brother. It's going to be okay. Somebody, somewhere, at some point, had to figure out they were ready for any new thing coming their way. So like the people who came before us, we lifted our arms even higher, closed our eyes even tighter, and breathed even deeper. and flew the way we always knew how to, free as the aunties and uncles and cousins who'd come before us, free as our own beautiful and brilliant minds. For a long time, 
The kids on the ground watched us. Then one by one, they lifted their arms. One by one, they too learned to fly. We will now play the children's benediction, which is in the back cover of your gray hymnal. Children, I'll meet you over by the door. morning. It is good to be with you, and we wish all the fathers out there and the male role models a wonderful Father's Day today. I invite you to settle in here as we create a place of communal caring and connection. It's our time to pause amidst the busyness of our lives, to slow down enough to consider the beauty that is here all around us, and to open a space for listening and love. Here, we honor all who support us in this caring, loving, and all-inclusive ministry. We send gratitude to Joe Payne, serving as our caring coordinator, arranging care for our members and friends and staff members in need for the last two weeks. Vicki Wolf will take over tomorrow for the next two, and we thank her for that. The members of our caring committee are wonderful examples of our compassionate community, holding us up as we go through challenging and happy times. And life can be challenging. We could all use some extra support with what life throws at us. And if you are experiencing those challenges in your life, we encourage you to reach out for support and help. If you need additional care or personal pastoral care, please reach out to Reverend Luke or myself with that request. In this community, we share pieces of our lives with one another. We do this because all people here have value. Each person's experience matters. We lift up those who are experiencing sadness, illness, or loneliness. May the strength and love in our congregation help guide you. We revel in those who are experiencing joys in their lives. May their happiness lift us all, and may their joy filter into all around them. We hold in our hearts this morning Julie Larson Keller and her family, Julie's brother Steve Larson, age 73, of Iowa City, Iowa, passed away on June 9th at home from esophageal cancer. He was comforted by his loving family, and we send love and comfort to all who knew Steve. Here, our service to each other, to the world, and to our faith is our focus. Let us carry that out into the wider world. May the faith and the spirit of life, love for the community of earth, and love for the light in each other be ours now and in all the days to come. Today, on this particular day, and in this particular month, we are imbued and surrounded by relationships. Some chosen, some given, some loving, some hard. It's a complex month with many complex dynamics. And so today, on this day, I wanted to offer a time for us to share a meta meditation, words of loving kindness that we can hold for ourselves and for others. I invite you to direct these words either to yourself, and that is absolutely okay and welcome. You can direct them to someone specific or a generalized body of people or to the broad and vast collective or however and whomever feels right for you in this moment. So settle in your seats, maybe set down your whatever you might be holding, 
rest comfortably, and let us breathe in and breathe out together as I share these words. May you be safe and protected in all ways. May no inner or outer harm come to you. May you find strength. May you find peace. May you feel love. And may you accept yourself completely and with great kindness, just as you are right now. Breathing in and breathing out. Thank you.
The first reading is a poem to my child, If Ever You Shall Be, by Ross Gay. The way the universe sat waiting to become, quietly, in the nether of space and time, you too remain some cellular snuggle dangling between my legs, curled in the warm swim of mostly quietest self. If you become, and who knows, I wonder, little bubble of unbudded capillaries, little one ever a swirl in my vascular galaxies, what would you think of this world which turns itself steadily into oblivion that hurts and hurts bad? Would you curse my careless caressing you into this world? Or would you rise up and mustering all your strength into that tiny throat which one day, no doubt, would grow big and strong, scream and scream and scream until you break back one, the, break the back of one just injustice, or at least get to your knees and kiss back to life some roadkill. I have so many questions for you, for you are closer to me than anyone has ever been, tumbling as you are this second through my heart's every chamber, your tiny, your teeny mouth singing along with the half-broke workhorse's steady boom and gasp. And since we're talking today, I should tell you, though I know sometimes you sneak a peek through your father's eyes, it's a glorious day, and there are millions of leaves collecting against the curbs, and they're, most, and they're the most delicate shade of gold we've ever seen and must favor the transparent wings of the angels you're swimming with, little angel. And as to your mother, well, I don't know, but my guess is that lilac bursts from her throat and she is both honeybee and wasp in some kind of moan to boot, and probably she dances in the morning, but who knows? You'll swim beneath that bridge if it comes, for now, let me tell you about the bush called the honeysuckle, that the sad call a weed, and how you could push your little sun-licked face into the throngs and breathe and breathe. Sweetness would be your name, and you would wonder why four of your teeth are so sharp, and the tiny mountain range of your knuckles are so hard. And you would throw back your head and open your mouth at the cows lowing their human songs in the field, and the pigs swimming in waste and clover, and everything on this earth, little dreamer, little dreamer of the new world, holy, every raindrop and sand grain and blade of grass, of grass worthy of grasp and joy and love, tiny shaman, tiny blood thrust, tiny trillion cells trilling and trilling, little dreamer, little hard hat, little heartbeat, little best of me. The second reading is The Earth is a Living Thing by Lucille Clifton. Is a black shambling bear ruffling its wild back and tossing mountains into the sea? Is a black hawk circling the burying ground, circling the bones picked clean and discarded? Is a fish black blind in the belly of water? Is a diamond blind in the black belly of coal? Is a black and living thing? Is a favorite child of the universe? Feel her rolling her hand in its kinky hair. Feel her brushing it clean. We will now accept the offering. the beekeeper with 
with a pitcher full of smoke will put us all to sleep I hope it's dreamless and it's deep sweet Prometheus come home they took away our fire and all that scarcity promotes is desperate men and time what fine design what hands what minds the envy of Eden our tools and our reason it's clear in the animal's eyes we stand upright build fires at night made on the sixth day to rest on the seventh and now we just try to survive and farmer meet each greets the other with a bow their kindred instruments you know the scalpel and the plow and in the shadow of the mountain we work when work abounds and we'll wear out all Dessa is one of my most favorite artists, so this was a treat. Thank you so much. Do you know what day is tomorrow? Juneteenth. Juneteenth. Tomorrow is Juneteenth. 
This is a day of jubilee that celebrates freedom, liberation, emancipation. It is Black Independence Day, the Black Fourth of July, America's second Independence Day. Juneteenth commemorates the emancipation of enslaved black people at the close of the Civil War. On June 19, 1865, federal troops arrived in Galveston, Texas to ensure the last remaining enslaved people were free. This action came nearly two and a half years after the Emancipation Proclamation was signed by Abraham Lincoln. Skip Gates, host of Finding Your Roots on PBS, wrote, of all the Emancipation Day observations, Juneteenth falls closest to the summer solstice, the longest day of the year when the sun at its zenith defies the darkness in every state, including those once shadowed by slavery. By choosing to celebrate the last place in the South that freedom touched, reflecting the mystical glow of history and lore, memory and myth, we remember the shining promise of emancipation, along with the bloody path that America took. Interest in this extraordinary day was renewed during the nationwide protests that followed the police killings of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. Juneteenth became our nation's 11th federally recognized holiday with the passage and signing of the federal Juneteenth National Independence Day Act in June of 2021. And just this February, Minnesota made it our state holiday. Now all 50 states and the District of Columbia recognize the day in some form. As the city of St. Paul makes clear in its 2023 proclamation, Juneteenth is a day of remembrance and acknowledgement of the history, freedom, culture, strength, perseverance and achievement of the past, present, and future generations of the African-American community. Juneteenth holds an important place not only in African-American history, but in Uni United States history for all Americans to reflect on, learn about, and appreciate the struggles, triumphs, and continued growth of our nation as a whole. Part of the struggles and the growth that are still needed are tied to environmental racism and the ways black Americans as a community of people have been displaced from or abused in the name of land. I chose both of our readings today that Heather shared from an anthology called Black Nature, which draws on four centuries of African American nature poetry. One of the poets, Ravi Howard, writes in an introduction, waves of paradise waters carried slave ships. In southern woodlands, both emancipation oaks and hanging trees. Along with the rice, tobacco, and cotton, the enslaved grew okra and yams, pieces of home for many transplanted Africans. The connections to nature those that haunt and those that nurture have been with us all along. As the poetry in this anthology explores, even during the most difficult periods of African American history, the natural world held the potential to be a source of refuge, of sustenance, and uncompromised beauty. At the same time, it reflects on the complexities of that relationship, considering how black people are tied up in the toil and soil involved in working this land into the country we now know today. Being in nature, whether in an urban neighborhood park or way out in the deep isolated wilderness and all points in between, can be a healing balm for our spirits, our nervous systems, our bodies, our relationships. And yet our responsibility to this interdependent web of life 
especially for those of us who are white, calls us not just to the pastoral natures of nature, but to reckon with how unequal access to a clean environment and basic environmental resources has been determined by race. All of this is exasperated by the realities of the planetary emergency the century and a half of human actions and inactions have created. Hop Hopkins with the Sierra Club writes, you can't have climate change without sacrifice zones. And you can't have sacrifice zones without disposable people. And you can't have disposable people without racism. So in our fight for a livable future for all, we see the depths of how climate justice and racial justice are intertwined. You cannot have one without the other. And when it comes to climate change, what we're talking about is carbon dioxide and methane. Those are the number one and number two drivers. But not all people are equally impacted. I'm going to throw some facts and figures at you just for a moment, just for a brief, brief moment, because I want you to consider these ways that race, even more than class, are these top indicators for the environmental racism that exists. Toxic facilities in this country are built because of the race of the people that they are located near. 75% of black Americans are more likely to live in these fence line places, places that produce noise, odor, traffic, where coal-fired power plants and incinerators and other industrial facilities emit mercury and arsenic, lead, and other contaminants into our water, food, and the lungs of the neighboring communities. Nationally, Black Americans experience significantly more environmental impact than white people. 71% live in counties that, that violate federal air pollution standards compared to 58% of whites. They are one and a half times more likely to have asthma, three times more likely to die from asthma. Nearly 14% of black children suffer from asthma as compared to about 7% of white children. And when we have natural disasters, government efforts to support and rebuild communities of color and low-income communities pale in comparison to efforts for higher income and white counterparts. Water contamination greatly affects children of color who live in rural areas, indigenous communities, and migrant farm worker communities. And sometimes when we look at these facts, they can feel a little abstract, a little too far removed. And so let's make them just a little bit more real. I don't know how many of you remember that water crisis that hit Jackson, Mississippi last summer. This capital city has one of the oldest water systems in the country. It's a place where one in four people live in poverty. And for a long time, well before this crisis hit, residents had been routinely directed to boil water for safety, and they often reported brown water, leaking sewage, low water pressure. But last summer, torrential rains cut off more than 150,000 people from safe drinking water. At the peak of the crisis, bottled water support and financial aid came in, and then, as it does in crisis, it faded away. What is happening in Jackson are major systemic challenges that aren't easily fixed. A black climate justice writer and podcaster named Mary Hegler writes and puts it this way very clearly. Climate change takes any problem you already had, any threat you were already under, and multiplies it. 
When you take a population that has lived in chronic crisis under constant threat for generations, whether it comes from police violence to housing discrimination to general disenfranchisement, disenfranchisement, and then you add yet another threat, that's not just a recipe for catastrophe. With the climate crisis itself, the storms and the temperatures, it's not so much that the game is rigged, it's the playing field. Climate, climate change is not the great equalizer. We are not all in this together. She says climate change is the great multiplier. Put plainly, we cannot underestimate a community's level of vulnerability or its resilience. For me, and for many of the people and communities of faith and spirituality and conscious that I work with in the movement, and I'm guessing for many of you as well, the climate crisis we're in, the environmental injustices that black people, people of color, and indigenous communities face, these injustices can bring about tremendous feelings of loss and grief and even despair, and we need to name that. We need to recognize that. It's easy and natural to wonder whether it's too late. Can we really heal and restore the planet, restore the harm we are causing to each other, restore right relationships across all of life? And these are tender and beautiful and holy questions. I think the NAACP's celebration of Juneteenth points us in a direction. They exclaim, in 1865, the last slaves were free. In 2023 and beyond, we are black and thriving. This isn't ignoring or minimizing history or the realities and change challenges that black Americans and all of us are facing today. This is bringing in the joy, the beauty, the wins that are happening, the love, the love. That's what brings us here together as a community, right? That's what's bringing me here to you today because in our work for justice, we have to rise up, we have to lift our voices, we have to remember that justice is not a cause. We're not building a transactional climate and racial justice movement. No, we're acting to transform the world. We need to bring our whole selves, our grief, our pain, our joy, our love. That's what's needed for the movement. Here in Minnesota, 2023 will go down in history as the year our state made its single largest one-time investment in climate initiatives and environmental protection. $640 million will be invested in our communities, invested in real environmental justice commitments. With these bills and policy changes and funding, we are charting a course forward for black, indigenous, and communities of color to fully and equitably participate in the rapidly unfolding clean energy revolution. And I wanna share just three highlights from this momentous session, work that MNIPL and our coalition partners have been part of. Minnesota is the third state to pass legislation that addresses the cumulative harms of industrial pollution. This legislation is currently limited to the seven county metro Duluth and here in Rochester, but it's a start. It's a start. And over the next three years, our work is making sure how we define the requirements that are in this legislation, that's gonna determine just how strong, the kind of teeth that it can hold. Second thing I wanna lift up, and this we did way back in January, so I hope you remember, because it was a great and beautiful day. We passed the 100% clean energy bill. 
This requires all Minnesota electric utilities to use only carbon-free electricity by 2040, and it requires utilities to procure 55 percent of their electricity from renewable sources by 2035. And finally, the last bill I want to lift up is one that MNIPL, the organization I'm part of, was particularly a leader in making happen. It has a terrible name, I'm not going to lie. It's called the Minnesota Climate Innovation Finance Authority, MNCFA. <laughs> Rolls right off the tongue, doesn't it? What this is, is essentially a green bank. There is this one-time investment of $45 million, and this will launch this um, state funding authority that will help communities, families, businesses, farms, congregations access money for renewable energy and other green projects. Truly, the breadth of the equity-based legislation that was passed this session is amazing. It, it really takes my breath away. There's this 15-page analysis document that our policy team put together with hundreds of line items that spell out just how much environmental justice communities, local income communities, tribal governments, underserved communities, migrant and immigrant communities, and so many others impacted by racial and social economic disparities, how much of a difference this funding, these bills, this legislation, these policy changes, center them and help to address the inequities and disparities that are before us and that are, are just embedded in every parts of our shared common life together. So on this Juneteenth, we have a lot to celebrate. Let us celebrate freedom and healing and advocacy. Let us celebrate environmental justice. Let us lift up our heads from what we just learned and close out this time with some joy and some movement because this is what we need to do in this work too. We need to feel the joy. We need to move our bodies. We need to feel how much our heart space can hold when we open ourselves to the possibilities and how Juneteenth calls us forth. So in just a moment, we're going to turn to a call and response and movement experience. I know you're already so excited. <laughs> this was created and written by a colleague of mine who's an amazing artist and minister named Julian Jamaica Soto. You get to participate, and I'm hoping we can bring the spirit of Juneteenth into this Cedar Brick Building. <laughs> All right? So there's two parts that you're going to join in. I'm going to say a line, lift your hands up, clap your hands, and guess what you're going to do? No, you get to actually just clap your hands. You can make some noise. If that feels too much for you, maybe just use your face to express an emotion. <laughs> maybe, maybe just feel your breath, right? And you'll have four chances to do something with your body so you can mix it up. Maybe, maybe clapping is not the first thing you do, but it's the fourth thing you do. We'll see what happens. Do what feels comfortable, or maybe do something that feels just a little uncomfortable, okay? The second part of this, and this is the call and response part where you actually do get to verbalize something, is I'll say a line, our people are free, and you'll repeat it back. Our people are free. All right, you ready? All right, here we go. For Juneteenth by Julianne Jamaica Soto. There was a moment when Harriet Tubman said, My people are free, even when the world didn't seem it, didn't show it. Lift your hands up, clap your hands. Our people are free. And in general order number three, the freed men are advised to remain quietly, freedom not yet manifest. Lift your hands up, clap your hands. Woo! Our people are free. We will not be quiet. 
We will sing for freedom, clap our hands for freedom, demand freedom of our voices, of our bodies, of our lives. Lift your hands up, clap your hands. Our people are free. Solidarity demands action for freedom. We will not live quietly and in our living. Be accountable for the ways in which black people are not yet free. Lift your heads up. Clap your hands this last time. Come on. Yes. Our people are free. You know it. Yes, yes. Blessed be and amen. Yes. just April 22nd. Pride Month is not just June. Tomorrow is not just Juneteenth. These days, these celebrations, these commemorations take place 365 days a year. Lift up your voice. Let's turn this world around, baby. Mm -hmm. 